Hello, this is the computer voice reading from the novel Tears Among the Wheat by H. Melvin James. This third audio blog segment is numbered 2024-03. If you have not listened to segments one and two, you should do that before listening to this one. Continuing in chapter one, Amelia is attending the funeral service of her estranged grandfather. As the preacher continues speaking, disinterested and impersonal, Amy struggles to remain awake, having little sleep the night before. To avoid falling asleep during the funeral, she has been reconsidering each of the dozen persons attending the service being conducted in a small chapel, a quaint solitary structure adjacent to a cemetery in a sparsely populated rural vicinity. I resume reading now from page 23. Abandoning any pretense of being attentive to the speaker, Amelia redirected her view to those seated across the aisle to her left. She confirmed her first impression of the man seated on the opposite front pew, nearest to her. Indeed, he was nicely dressed, polite, and ruggedly handsome. Still quietly entertaining herself, to avoid the embarrassment of dozing to sleep again, she considered each of the man's observed traits, one at a time. She acknowledged to herself that she saw him as dashing, interesting, sexually attractive, she obliterated her thoughts as quickly as they had surprised her. A sensation she had not felt since her husband's death had risen from her neck and engulfed her cheeks. Intentionally reconsidering the attractive man as abstractly as she could manage, Amy recalled her first sight of him only a fraction of an hour earlier. She had watched him enter the church, escorting a feeble elderly couple through the doors and down the aisle, one on each arm. She noticed his apparent strength, effortlessly supporting the two elders. Again, she had to forbid her thoughts from venturing further speculation of the handsome stranger's physique. She recalled the man and the two elders stepping up to her. The man graciously nodded and greeted her with a strong, confident voice. He offered his sympathy with sincerity, and then he introduced his parents, Hope and Daniel Covington. Finally, he introduced himself with a nod. Clifton Covington, but you may call me Cliff, if you please. Amelia studied the young Mr. Kivington during the ensuing conversation. She estimated his age to be about 30, within a year or two of her own. He considerately told her, as if to convey some comfort to her, that his mother and father were the nearest of friends to both of your grandparents, Lex and Doreen McClary. There was a hint of affection in his pronouncing the names. As he talked and gestured, Amelia observed he did not wear a wedding ring. Then, she privately rebuked herself for being so presumptuous. Since the time of her young marriage, she had not journeyed far from home, especially not alone, and now she was considering romancing a stranger. With those thoughts, she admonished herself for behaving like an adolescent flirtatious schoolgirl. Amelia would later learn the elder Covingtons had indeed been lifelong intimate, and loyal friends to her maternal grandparents, Lex and Doreen McClary. In those years long past, the McClary-Covington Quartet enjoyed a warm, rich, and rare intimacy. It was a close bond, beginning in their high school years, and, except for periods of separation, growing and enduring for much of their adult lives. In their restless youth before marriage, first Lex and then Dan joined the military. They each found themselves in the ranks of doughboys, boasting they could straighten up Europe's mess in a matter of a few weeks. Dan, the more practical, enlisted locally in the United States Army only after America entered the war. Lex, the more adventurous, hitched rides on various wheeled vehicles to gain his way to Canada. There he enlisted in the Royal Flying Corps, getting into the fray a full year ahead of America. His enlistment was not done of patriotism or sense of duty. Bewildered and disillusioned with his life, Lex was daring fate to have her way with him. And like a seasoned prostitute with a virgin young man, fate did indeed have her way with him. Eventually, both Lex and Dan served in France at the same time, but they never happened to meet in that cluttered theater of war. Dan's war was grounded in mud while Lex's war was suspended above. Knowing of the other's branch, Dan serving in artillery and Lex serving in the Air Corps, each at times looked toward the other's realm and wondered if their friend was in their view and if he was being spared mutilation or death. 
Each war fighter witnessed indescribable horrors of battle, and each suffered wounds of flesh and soul. Against the odds, their wounds of body and bludgeoning of spirit essentially healed, at least superficially, to render them physically able. Emotionally, however, they remained only precariously adequate to return to civil society following the armistice. Their relationship after the war was never as carefree and fun as were their teenage years, or at least as the comparison was relevant to Dan. Sometimes, though, they found brief precious moments of laughter, but only while the demons in their heads swooned with alcohol. As a result of several head concussions suffered during the war, as Amelia met him at Lexington's funeral, Dan was now ailing of Parkinson's disease and senility. As somewhat of a blessing, Hope acknowledged to Amy later, as an incidental blessing of his condition, Dan enjoys peace of mind, free of war's haunting memories and the untold horrors of law enforcement. His diminished memory has granted him a childlike innocence. Upon meeting Amelia in the chapel, Cliff's father's expression brightened as he excitedly exclaimed, Doreen. No, father. Cliff quickly corrected, this is Amelia. She is Doreen's granddaughter. But no matter, the old man's expression had already dimmed as he redirected his attention elsewhere, or rather nowhere, and seemed neither to hear nor care. Cliff's mother, Hope, complimented Amelia on her appearance. Since Amelia would be traveling home the next day, Hope insisted she come to supper at their house that evening. The gentle lady said she would be delighted to have the opportunity to tell Amelia about her magnificent grandparents, especially about those glorious times when the four of us were young and strong, oh, and so bold and confident. Then she added, it would be wonderful if you could stay for another couple of days at least. There would be much to discuss and we could become much better acquainted. You can stay with us at no expense. You see, I lost your grandmother as my best friend about 20 years ago, and I have so dearly missed her. Your being here is a little like having her near again. Amy found Hope to be delightfully charming, and she felt instantly befriended. She sensed the senior Mr. Covington's senility had rendered him the character of an innocent young boy. In her interactions with Danny, not Dan, as he insisted, Amy quickly and comfortably assumed the role of grown-up to a child, following the lead of Cliff and his mother. Continuing her accounting of the church's assembly, sitting in the midsection, across the aisle, were two elderly well-dressed gentlemen. Arriving together, they sought Amy out and introduced themselves gallantly, as if she was a visiting royal princess. Amy was so charmed as to reward their chivalry with a curtsy. They were enthralled. The huskier gentleman introduced himself as Arnold Blavin and forthwith announced himself as Lexa's loyal friend and banker from back in the good old days and the other, Dr. Nelson Klein. Exceedingly pleased to meet you. He then proudly identified himself as the family's general practitioner and mocking his associate's introduction, he added, in the grand old days. They smelled mildly of whiskey and cigars. But those intriguing aromas were blended with others, cologne, the scent of cedar, and a hint of mothballs, probably from the closets where their scarcely aired suits had long, until recently, resided. They tried to be remorseful to befit the occasion, but their sense of humor, quick wit, and one-upmanship tickled Amelia to the extent she had to cup her nose and mouth with her handkerchief to keep from either bursting with laughter or snorting to resist laughing aloud. At one point during the trio's conversation, Mr. Blavin drew close to Amy's left side and softly spoke as he wrapped his right arm to her right shoulder. Darlin', I gathered some old papers from the bank basement. The documents dealt with your grandfather's banking, loan papers, investments, and such. As he spoke, Amy's eyes were drawn to his. He had bright brown eyes. As he talked, his eyes reflected the sunlit windows in twinkles of perfect timing, accentuating the punch lines of his clever quips. Amy's senses, those conscious and those of intuition, concurred. These two of her grandfather's longtime associates were honorable and trustworthy. Her intuition had seldom led her wrong, and it was now quietly suggesting to her, these two men were of integrity and goodwill. Amy was pleased to learn her grandfather was befriended by such good souls. 
Amy reasoned, if a man can indeed be judged by the company he keeps, her grandfather must have had qualities of character. But she recognized the contrasting character of Lexington's lawyer, Mr. Haggett, as a contradiction of the adage. The old banker continued, the papers are of no currency, all null and void. But although they are no longer of any relevance, I thought you might want to have them, perhaps as glimpses into your family history. He smiled broadly and tilted his head back. He had retrieved his arm from her shoulder and now held his hands up chest high, as if holding an invisible basketball. Lex and I transacted a lot of business in those days, ventures great and small. Lex was bold and ambitious in his endeavors, but he was also resourceful and responsible. He brought a good measure of adventure and excitement to my otherwise monotonous work of balancing ledgers. Until, until, well, something changed in him. Mr. Blavin's expression became sober. His lips pursed. Dr. Klein was quick to break the uncomfortable silence. Well, in between those times when Arnold conducted business with Lex, the two of them seated comfortably in his office, sharing brandy, and, I would wager, those idle pastimes were undoubtedly practiced more often and for longer periods of time than their business deals justified. I, by stark contrast, dutifully attended to Lexa's medical demands. Stitching his wounds and splinting his fractured bones was no call to follow up with cigars and brandy wine. Lex was always in the thick of the action. If his ranch hands were working cattle, wrestling them down, branding, cutting off horns, or one of a hundred other such dangerous and dirty chores, one could bet that Lex would be in the middle of the fray. It would usually take me longer to clean the mud and manure from his gashes than to stitch him up. And when it came to drilling for oil or keeping the pump jacks working, you couldn't tell him from the roughnecks, smeared every inch with oil and stinking of the black crude. It was only by the grace of God that he never contracted blood poisoning or gangrene. Unlike old Arnold here, I could not say my experience with Lex was enjoyable. Keeping him patched up was drudgery and worry. But I must admit, he did gain my admiration for his exceptional fortitude. He had other admirable traits, too, the most obvious of which I could never qualify precisely. Those included either tremendous bravery or stubborn foolhardiness, or both, he added as he shook his head at the floor. But in my ultimate analysis, Lex replenished my opinion of mankind. He stood apart from the wimps, hypochondriacs, and fatalists I often treated during my practice. Now turning and frowning at his companion, the old doctor teased, and, Arnold, my old friend, I don't believe anything mysterious or transcendental changed Lex. I believe he simply succumbed to a stroke. Although I would have to say, his symptoms were not entirely typical. The doctor had clutched Arnold's forearm. Amy could see, the two of them were close friends, and she appreciated that the two gentlemen were once close to her grandfather. Beginning to gain familiarity with her grandfather's character, Amy wondered if he had allowed anyone to become close, to confess or confide, without reservation of shame, his most painful and private of troubles, in the manner of true friends. Amy was enjoying the warm and friendly conversation with Arnold and Nelson when the mortician abruptly interrupted with a disingenuous hasty apology. He coaxed the two gentlemen to the side aisle, speaking softly and gesturing mechanically. It seemed they had been drafted as impromptu pallbearers. Attorney Haggett had apparently neglected to arrange for pallbearers or to at least check with the mortician or the minister to ascertain that all principal elements for a funeral were in place. Then, left standing alone, Amy was approached by a couple, modest in all respects. They were now seated two rows behind her. They appeared to be in their late thirties, but a casual and considerate glance might judge them a decade or more older, lest their trying lives were suspected and accounted. Amy hoped the tedious labor and worrisome struggles of her own life would not soon render her appearance so much older than her years. Returning to her scrutiny of the couple, Amy observed their garments showed slight fading and wear, but they were clean and pressed. Their mismatched outfits suggested either ignorance of fashion or, more likely, a limited wardrobe from which to choose. The modest couple introduced themselves as Claudia and Delbert Delaney. More to make idle conversation than stemming from interest, 
Amy asked them ordinary questions. She learned they lived in Nakatomwa, a small town in the wooded hills wilderness of the far southeast sector of the state. Delbert talked with a delightfully entertaining hill country accent. His vernacular, unique slang terms, and the twang in his voice suggested colorfully blended accent of the vicinity, Arkansas hillbilly, Texas strawl, and Louisiana Cajun. Amy assumed the odd name of the Delaney's hometown was derived from the Native American culture. As a means to remember introductions, it was her habit to silently pronounce to herself the names of newly met people and their associations, towns, workplaces, and such. She found the Delaney's hometown name to be difficult to pronounce to herself, and she couldn't imagine how it might be spelled or even if principles of English phonics applied to such names. She was about to ask Delbert to restate the name of the town, but his anxious determination to explain their connection to the late Mr. McClary allowed no interruption. Delbert continued, nervously recounting details of his mother and father doing business with Mr. McClary for years, and attempting an air of sophistication to his voice, always remarked highly of him. He added, all through my childhood, I remember times Mr. McClary visited us. He often brought good things to eat, storybooks and boxes of pencils, writing tablets, crayons, and such as that, and at Christmas time, toys for all us kids. Claudia abruptly interjected with an uncomfortably shrill voice. It was an orphan's home, you see. Delbert was abandoned as a baby, and the Delaney's adopted him, she added. Baby Delbert was left in the train station depot where Mr. Delaney worked, sweeping and mopping the floors, emptying ash cans, and keeping the place tidy. Delbert seemed embarrassed, but he remained politely silent as his wife continued. Mr. Delaney, Delbert's adoptive father, she stated pragmatically, told me Mr. McClary had read about the adoption in the newspaper, and he came to visit the Delaney's from 250 miles away. And right then, and their Mr. McClary talked them into starting up an orphanage, with Mr. McClary providing the money and the Delaney's doing the work. Now that was how it was. Delbert provided the epilogue. Mama and Daddy got so old, they could hardly take care of themselves, nary the kids. So, the government came and took the last three kids they still had. I was grown up by then and married to Claudia. We live next door. Amy's conversation with the Delaney's then lulled, but in that moment the minister stepped onto the podium and stated, please be seated. The funeral then commenced. This was the second of a series of readings from the epic novel, Tears Among the Wheat, by H. Melvin James. This novel is available worldwide from all major online bookstores as a paperback, hardcover, or ebook in various formats. Return to this website to hear the continuation of this saga. Thank you for listening.